Hi, I'm Jim Cates. I'm a psychologist, and this is the ninth in a series of lectures on human development. And in this particular theory, as in the last and the next couple that we'll discuss, it's looking at the combination of nature and nurture, looking at epigenetic or biological factors and how they interact with the environment or the culture or society to create development. And as usual, start with a vignette talking about cognitive social historical theory. So Jasmine, age three and a half, is playing with Legos. She's building a big birthday cake. And at 7.30, her dad says, Jasmine, five minute warning. It's almost time for bed. And Jasmine begins to ask the question that most children her age would ask sooner or later, why? Why does she need to go to bed? She needs to go to bed to rest, her father answers. But why? Because she has a busy day. She had a busy day, her father says. But why? So she can go to bed, rest. She can have a good time tomorrow. And what are we going to do tomorrow? We're going to see Grandma. But why? Well. Following cognitive social historical theory, higher order mental processes emerge in an interpersonal context as children interact with others. And the idea is that a child is born into a cultural context. So in the early years, a child, child's thinking advances depending on conversations and encouragement from others also modeling from these more knowledgeable others. So in the vignette, Jasmine uses the simple word why, partly to get out of bedtime, obviously. Anyone who's had a child that young knows that kids will use why to stall. But it also achieves a couple of other goals. It stimulates social conversation with her father. And it provides a verbal tool for gaining more information. Now, Jasmine may not understand all the information that's uncovered, but the pattern of interaction creates a model for her about how to pursue information. And depending on what answers she receives, what answers she understands, when her father gets tired of answering why questions and says no more, it gives her the boundaries. It gives her understanding of what questions to ask, when to ask questions, how to ask questions, and begins to frame and shape how her curiosity can be satisfied. And in modern society, the use of why is a very much accepted approach for problem solving. Now, Piaget, who we studied earlier, acknowledge the significance of social factors, especially parents and peers. But in contrast, Vygotsky, who is theory we're studying now, cognitive social historical theory, uh, is often referred to as an interactionist. And he argued that development can only be understood within a social, cultural, historical framework. And at the heart of his work is a focus on thinking. And he said that it links to the development of language and speech in childhood. So the crux here for him is the combination of cognition and speech or language. And Vygotsky saw both a continuous path from animals to humans, but a discontinuous path as well. So he saw two separate things happening. He conceptualized natural or lower mental processes and higher mental processes. He saw these as distinct. Lower mental processes can be observed in animal behavior, problem solving, that infants and very young children use. So classical conditioning, operant conditioning, trial and error learning, all of those are lower mental processes from Vygotsky. Higher mental processes arise when 
children end up mastering the cultural tools of their society. And children will differ in their development based on the cultural symbol systems to which they're exposed. So let me step back and talk about historical context for a minute about Vygotsky. Leb Semyonovich Vygotsky was a live hard, die young kind of guy. He was born in 1896, the same year as Piaget. But he was from a family of eight children. His father was a bank executive, his mother was a teacher. But he contracted tuberculosis and died in 1934. So still in his late 30s when he passed away. He did have a distinguished career in Russia, but many of his works ended up being banned by the Communist Party. And so as a result, translations of much of his work into English didn't occur until the early 1960s. But he worked to create an integrated psychology of cognitive behavior that recognized the interaction of neurological mechanisms, developmental history of cognition from simple to more complex forms, and the role of society in influencing ways that higher order cognitive capacities emerge over time in development. And as I said, he had a strong emphasis on language as a cognitive tool. And that allows a person to modify stimulus situations as, the, as a part of the process of responding to it. Now, and I should say up front, critics often argue that Vygotsky's work was cleaned or sanitized before it was ever released to Western readers, and therefore it may not represent his true views. And there's probably some reality to that. Um, Communist Party leaders looked over what was released and how it was released, uh, and we do know that there was editing of his work done. But what remains is a, a contribution from Vygotsky that is significant. And we also know Vygotsky continued to refine and modify his theories and was doing so at the time of his death. And we also know that some of his theoretical presentations <clears throat> ended up being completed by colleagues and editors even after his death. So be aware, this is a theoretical presentation that is more in the rough than some of the models that have been presented and will be presented. What are the key concepts, though, that come out of his work? He has four primary concepts. He sees culture as a mediator of cognitive structuring. He sees movement from the intermental to the intramental and I'll talk more about that in just a minute, obviously. He refers to inner speech and the zone of proximal development. So culture as a mediator of cognitive structure. For Vygotsky, culture is both a physical setting, uh, tools and technologies, and it's also a pattern or pattern system of beliefs and customs and information and social relationships. So for him, culture shapes the content of thought and also the process through which ideas are developed. And in particular, he's interested in tools and signs as human inventions that shape thought. What does he mean by tools? He isn't just referring to what we immediately think of as tools, what comes to mind. He's also referring to things like vehicles and weapons. He's referring to the full gamut of uh, concrete, tangible items that we utilize in any culture to make it through the day, that, that allow us to access and to uh, manipulate our environment. He's also talking about signs, which are psychological tools, counting systems, strategies for remembering, all the things that occur that, again, are somewhat cultural, 
but also allow us to manipulate and manage problem solving and activities of daily living. So tools change the way we organize and think about the world, be they tangible and concrete, or be they signs, psychological tools. And Vygotsky demonstrated that children follow a common path in development of a higher order of thinking. In the early years, there's no use of cultural tools, the very earliest years. In the second phase, children use symbolic aids that have been provided, but there's no real ability to create their own, and they have limited ability to manipulate those they have. If you look back at some of the best articulated developmental theories, for example, Piaget or Erickson, uh, you again find that this is a common theme. Uh, infants, very young infants, do not have symbolic language, obviously, and it seems that they have very little ability to articulate or categorize things. So for a very young infant, it, it seems they may be able to, to identify uh, a shape, a triangular shape that's green as a tree, and they may eventually be able to articulate or, or identify that triangular shapes that are green are trees. They come to that recognition. In the second phase, however, they, they really realize that all of these triangular shapes are in the category trees, but that's all they have. They have the ability to understand that this is a category. They have very little ability to articulate or to understand or to categorize beyond that. And they can't really manipulate much beyond the fact of understanding that this is a tree. You get into the third stage and they're beginning to develop new, new strategies. And at a very primitive level of the early third stage, this is a tree, this is a bush, uh, this is an oak tree, again I've used before, this is a birch tree. These are different types of trees. Uh, you begin to see the manipulation in their mind and their ability to categorize and to come up creatively with their own solutions. This is a healthy tree, this is a disease tree. I mean, they begin to put these things together in their minds and be able to do this. So there's a process that goes on. And in the final stage, they're able to internalize prompts or clues and cultural tools mediate this task and support new levels of behavior that appear more integrated and automatic. So they've moved from staring at, uh, as an infant, someone new that comes into their environment and not being sure about them to the fluidity of social interaction and knowing how to interact socially with someone. And that process has occurred through this early years, second phase, third phase, on into the, the internalized abilities that have developed. And how does that happen for Vygotsky? Language is the sign system that dramatically alters human cognition. And it's primarily a social process that links individuals but it becomes a tool that guides mental activities. And as noted, it goes from intermental to intramental. Intermental being between two people to intramental occurring within an individual's mind. And that may initially be contrary to common sense. But Vygotsky argues that higher mental processes begin in external activity that's gradually reconstructed and internalized. Take a very simple example, pointing. Uh, an infant will initially reach towards an object out of reach, stretches the hand toward it. I'm not sure what this is gonna to do to the focus on the video camera, so bear with me for a second here, but if I reach toward the video camera, 
and I grasp. If I'm an infant and I do this, the assumption is that visual acuity is not well enough developed, at least in a very young infant, that they can ascertain that the video camera is out of reach. So what they do is reach and over time learn that certain objects are out of their reach. So what happens for most is that they make a reaching motion, they may make a noise with it, but the reaching motion occurs. Now, remember to go back to the, uh, the behavioral work on human development and remember that the most difficult behavior to extinguish is intermittently reinforced. So infants are constantly, I'll do this to the side in case I'm blurring the focus, infants are constantly reaching for things. Sometimes no one's there when they reach. Sometimes the adult in the room doesn't want to give them whatever they're reaching for because it's not good for them. But in any case, lots of times the infant is not reinforced by getting what they reach for. And then other times they are reinforced. And it's a variable intermittent or intermittent uh, reinforcement ratio. So reaching becomes a heavily reinforced behavior. Uh, very difficult to extinguish because of that. So the reaching behavior exists, continues, and also the mother's recognition of the purpose of the behavior is an intermittent, intermental coordination between parent and child. And the mother begins to say, what do you want? What do you need? And she may even shape the behavior by pointing. Point to what you want. Show me what you want. And the infant learns to point. So pointing becomes an early behavior that is ingrained for infants to learn how to say what they want and need. It starts out, though, as an intermental behavior because it involves an interaction with an adult who has to give them what they want, but it becomes an intramental process as the infant realizes that pointing behavior will get them what they need. And this process of internalizing external cues continues over and over and over again. And that's the intramental becoming intramental. And with the tool of language then, the child is able to describe and analyze a situation and draw on past experience. And the more complicated the cognitive demands of a task, the more likely the child is to use spoken language to guide problem solving. So the child learns over time how to ask for more complicated requests or how to engage in more complicated interactions. So the child moves from one word sentences to two word sentences to complex sentences in order to get needs met. What about inner speech? Well, Vygotsky argued that speech plays a central role in self-regulation self-directed goal attainment, and in any kind of practical problem solving. And problem solving behaviors of toddlers involve both speech and action. Now, Piaget described toddlers as using egocentric speech to accompany behavior. And Piaget was saying, toddlers talk out loud, but they seem unconcerned whether anyone can hear them. So for Piaget, ego, it was egocentric speech because it doesn't seem to have any social intention. And for, for him, egocentric speech was evidence of the absence of a social life. Vygotsky disagreed. 
Vygotsky says speech begins in the social interaction between children and adults or between children and other children. Therefore, egocentric speech is merely a transformation of this social speech inward. And a child uses speech initially acquired through interactions with others to guide their own behaviors. So private speech that guides problem solving emerges from social speech that characterizes children's interactions with adults. And eventually, it becomes inner speech. So that would be Vygotsky's process of how this all occurs. One of the more interesting and enduring of Vygotsky's key concepts is the zones of proximal or the zone of proximal development. And it takes the idea of internalization one step further. And it tries to explain the relationship of learning and development. And Vygotsky says that every child functions at a certain mental age and has the potential to advance in middle age. The zone of proximal development then is the distance between actual development and the level of potential development. And for Vygotsky, the level of functioning a child can reach when taking advantage of the guidance of others reflects the functions in the process of maturation as opposed to those that have already matured. In other words, Vygotsky believes that development lags behind learning. So if a child is stimulated to engage in new ideas, in new learning beyond what they know or understand, that triggers development. Learning comes first and then comes development. So Vygotsky's zone of proximal development is a unique contribution. It speaks to a child's current and potential developmental levels. And he noted that movement within the zone can be prompted not only by instruction, but by the child's own play. Because in pretend play, a child can address areas of their life where they don't yet feel competent, but they can act as if they are. So again, zone of proximal development. What are some of the new directions where Vygotsky's theory has been taken? Well, it had enormous influence on cross-cultural studies of development. Prior to its introduction, the focus was primarily on how children would handle developmental tasks based on theories formulated in the United States and in Western Europe. Work such as Vygotsky's helped theorists realize that tasks were not as generalizable as had initially been presumed. His work also stimulated something called cultural historical activity theory. And it was a contemporary extension of Vygotsky's theory, but Vygotsky gave it more traction. And it no longer sees culture as static, but recognizes that culture is dynamic. And cognitive development, then, is inter intricately intertwined with the activities in which a child participates. So CHAT, Cultural Historical Activity Theory, looks at the integration of individual interpersonal and cultural levels of analysis. And in contrast to considering the impact of cultural and individual development, researchers use a sociocultural approach and view the individual, the interpersonal, and the cultural as operating together. So strengths and weaknesses of Vygotsky's approach 
it introduced an entirely new perspective on cognition. The idea that it was located at the interface of person and culture had not really been considered previously. It places new emphasis on the interactive, interpersonal learning environment. Again, a different focus. Its views about the role of instruction in development continues to gain followers in educational circles. And Vygotsky did use empirical work to support his theories. What are the weaknesses? Due both to the suppression of his work and his untimely death, many of his concepts remain undeveloped. Uh, the zone of proximal development has been the most widely accepted piece of the model, but it's also been the most criticized. Operationalizing it is difficult. And he also, Vygotsky, fails to offer a model of what normal development should look like. He talks about phases. He talks about a process of moving forward in human development, but he doesn't talk about what normal development should be. And some argue that there's an overstatement of the interaction between speech and thought. It's also a theory that was born in the social and political philosophy of Marxism. And as such, it emphasizes that the mind is born in participation with the community. That may be true, but that may be also a culturally uh, limited approach. And so the generalizability of that outside a Marxist philosophy or a culture which holds a Marxist philosophy uh, may come into question. So, again, its generalizability may come into question. Interesting theory, interesting approach, certainly different than many others, but that's cognitive social historical theory.